Michael Burry has predicted two of the biggest bubbles in recent decade, the dot-com bubble and the global financial crisis. And in a recent interview with Bloomberg News, he says that we're in an indexing bubble. Now, this first came to light for me when it was mentioned on one of our Sunday evening live Q&A calls. And remember, you can join us on those for just $5 a month. So to see exactly what kind of comparisons he's making, and he makes some shocking ones, but also a very good point about value, let's look at that in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Michael Berry's got a huge amount of experience with financial markets. In 2000, he founded Scion Capital, and he very effectively called the dot-com bubble. And by shorting stocks, he managed to make a profit even when the S&P 500 was falling. But most impressive of all, in 2005, he forecast that the real estate bubble would burst in 2007. In 2008, he'd returned over 22% per annum to the investors of Scion Capital. You probably wouldn't have heard of him if he hadn't been mentioned in Michael Lewis's book, The Big Short, which was then turned into a fantastic movie, where Michael Berry's character was played by Christian Bale. As Eric Balkunas points out, Michael Lewis, who wrote The Big Short, is actually an index investor. So let's start with Berry's point about price discovery. He starts off talking about how banking regulation has reduced the amount of risks that banks can take. And in turn, that's reduced the liquidity of markets because those banks can carry less inventory. Think of it like a supermarket with just one can of beans or just one bottle of milk. And added to that, he points out that passive investing has removed price discovery from the equity markets. Now, price discovery is just the ability of markets to sort out the good companies from the bad companies, where good usually means profitable and able to return value to shareholders. If you just passively follow an index, then you're not looking at value at all. You simply buy companies in proportion to the size of the company for a market cap weighted index. So by removing the requirement for security level analysis, which active managers perform, he's saying that we're not going to get true price discovery. James Safer from Bloomberg Research has shared these two pie charts. These compare 2013 and 2018 based on the amount of money which is being run in active mutual funds versus passive exchange traded funds and index funds. And while active represented about two thirds of the market in 2013, in 2018 it was roughly 50 50. And given the rapid growth of passive funds, we're likely to have passed that point of 50% in 2019. Jack Bogle made a really interesting point about price discovery in 2017. He said that you could still have price discovery even if indexing was around the 70, 80 or 90% level as a proportion of total funds. And the reason was that there'd always be people looking for value. So active wouldn't have to be a huge proportion of the market in order to have effective price discovery. Now many people have made that point about price discovery. I hear it almost every week. But I think much more shocking is Barry's comparison of CDOs with ETFs. He compares what he calls the indexing bubble with the bubble in synthetic asset-backed CDOs before the great financial crisis. Because he says indexing has massive capital flows, just like CDOs did, which isn't underlined by fundamental security level analysis. But comparing an ETF with a CDO is a bit like comparing a cheetah with a hippopotamus. They're very different beasts. Let's see why. Firstly, what is a CDO? It's not something most of us are familiar with. CDO stands for Collateralized Debt Obligation. At the heart of a CDO is a pool of assets. In this case, RMBS. Once you've got your pool of assets, you can create a set of CDO tranches, which are based on the risk from the pool of assets. And the word tranche comes from the French word for slice. But the key thing is that you're slicing up the risk. So when you sell these tranches to clients, you have the low risk, low yield tranche at the top, which is supposedly AAA or very high credit quality, because you only lose capital on that tranche if all of the tranches underneath it have been completely eaten away by defaults on those loans. But because that's low risk, that earns you the lowest yield. Then the AA tranche takes more risk and gives you a higher return, and so on, until you get to the equity tranche, which is like the toxic waste. But it also gives you the highest yield. You're much more likely to be familiar with an exchange-traded fund. This is the granddaddy of all exchange-traded funds, the Spider SPY fund. 
This was launched in 1993, and it tracks the S&P 500 US Equity Index. And it's completely transparent. You can see the top 10 holdings here, and also the weights held by the ETF. And in effect, this is just a portfolio of stocks, which you can buy off the shelf. And the price of the ETF is just a weighted average of the price of the stocks inside the ETF. If the weights of the portfolio match those of the S&P 500, then you'll also match the price movements of the S&P 500. And that's why these are usually called trackers, because they track some kind of index, like the S&P 500. But the primary difference between CDOs and ETFs becomes very apparent if you look at the pricing. To get an intuition of how you price a CDO, we can use an analogy which is a medieval castle. Let's say you're selling insurance and you charge people a premium in order to store their gold. Naturally, some nasty guys are going to try and bust your castle. How are they going to do that? Well, they dig a hole under the castle, they fill it with explosive, and they blow it up. And these people were known as sappers. And if they got it right and didn't blow themselves up first, you can see what happened. They blow up the ramparts, the castle walls fall, and then the invading army can stream into the castle and steal your gold. So naturally, castle builders built up a defence against this happening. It was called a concentric castle, and that's like a castle within a castle. You can see two sets of walls. Well, now you can charge two premiums. The outer ward is less safe than the inner ward, so you'd probably charge more to insure the gold in this outer region, which is more dangerous. And because the inner ward is safer, it would cost less to insure your gold. To bring us back into CDO world, we're going to change the terminology. The field around the castle is called the equity tranche. This is the most dangerous region of all. There's no castle wall protecting it. The area within the outer wall is called the mezzanine zone. And the area in the inner sanctum is called the senior zone. Now where would you attack this castle? You can probably see the design flaw. The points where I've shown the arrows are where the walls are very close together. So if a sapper breaches the wall at that point, they could breach both walls at once. It's as if both walls were just one wall, and the inner wall would offer no extra protection. So to stop the correlation of the walls falling together, you'd move the inner wall away from the outer wall. And that way, the sappers couldn't blow up both walls at once. And that's why correlation is key to pricing a CDO. When correlation is high, then all of the tranches could default at the same time. And the pricing of all three tranches converges onto the same expected loss. But if the correlation is lower, there's a divergence between the equity tranche, which is the most risky, and the senior tranche, which is the most safe. So while that's the intuition about how to price a CDO, you do need to do some fairly hardcore maths, or at least Monte Carlo simulation, in order to price them properly. It's a far cry from an ETF, where the price is just the weighted average of the prices of the stocks. Another huge difference between CDOs and ETFs is leverage. In the Financial Crisis Inquiry report, which went through the reasons for the financial crisis, you can see that leverage and CDOs go hand in hand. What is leverage? It's just investing borrowed money. That increases your profits in good times, but also increases your losses in bad times. In other words, it amplifies your risk and your return. And CDOs introduce leverage at every level. So firstly, a mortgage for a home loan is itself leveraged, particularly if you make a low down payment, because most of your investment will be borrowed money. Then mortgage-backed securities, which package up those home loans and the CDOs into which they were placed, produce further leverage, because they're financed with debt. Even more complex were synthetic CDOs, which instead of containing bonds, contained credit default swaps, which amplified the leverage further. Now for the vast majority of ETFs, if we look at the index value on the x-axis and we plot that versus the value of the ETF, they tend to move up and down one for one. And that's why ETFs are sometimes called Delta 1 products. They have this one-to-one -one movement with the underlying index. Whereas for a leveraged asset like a CDO, if the underlying index increases, the asset value will increase by more in this case twice as much, and if the index falls, the asset value will fall by twice as much. Here I've plotted the S&P 500 daily return over the last 15 years versus the daily return on the S&P tracker SPY. Notice how the daily returns fall onto the straight line. The ratio is 1 to 1, 
and that's because it's a Delta One product with no leverage. So this is another way in which ETFs and CDOs are utterly different. Now let's move on to Barry's points about liquidity, which in investment terms means how long it takes to sell an asset to turn it into cash. Barry says that the dirty secret of passive index funds is the distribution of daily dollar value traded amongst the securities within the indexes they mimic. Although in fact all of his arguments also apply to any fund, whether it's active or passive, as long as that fund is benchmarked against some kind of index. Now one way to measure liquidity is to look at the difference between the buying price and the selling price of a stock. I've plotted that on a y-axis, so a big spread at the top means that a stock is illiquid, and a low spread at the bottom means that the stock is easy to sell and also cheap to buy and sell, and very liquid. And on the x-axis, I've got the average daily turnover. So that's how much of the stock traded hands every day, averaged over the last 25 days. So we've got large caps on the right and small caps on the left. Now what you can see is this really clear relationship such that large caps have higher liquidity and small caps have lower liquidity. And that's what Berry means when he talks about the Russell 2000 index, which is a US mid cap and small cap index. And that has a huge tail of tiny stocks, which are lower volume and lower value traded stocks with low turnover. And he backs that up with some statistics showing that over a thousand of the stocks on the day he looked at the market traded less than five million dollars in value, which is tiny for the US stock market. And he makes the point that if a very large amount of money is indexed against the Russell 2000, then hundreds of billions could be linked to these tiny stocks. And he says the same is true of the S&P 500. And he makes a nice analogy, which is to say that the theatre keeps getting more crowded but the exit door is the same as it always was, implying that if everyone gets out at the same time, there won't be room. But of course, this is a well-known fact, so that microcap stocks trade at huge bid-offer spreads, and they tend to be very illiquid. And if you look at the bid-offer spreads in the morning, they're typically worse than they are in the afternoon, as shown in this data from Brian Livingston. There are two orders of magnitude difference in the bid-offer spread between the smallest and the largest stocks on the US stock exchange. But in fact, ETFs have found a way around that, which is called sampling. Instead of buying all of the stocks in the index in the same weight as the index, you only buy a subset of them and adjust the weights in a clever mathematical way such that you track the index as closely as possible. The stocks you miss out are the ones which are least liquid, and that would typically be the smallest stocks in the index. So for example, if you're tracking emerging market stock indices, which tend to be less liquid than developed market stocks, you're likely to use one of these sampling methods. But also if you're tracking a huge index like MSCI World, where it may not be practical to buy all of the stocks in the index. I've illustrated that here with a really simple example, where the blue line is the S&P 500, and the red line is a really simple portfolio with just three of the biggest stocks in the index. Of course, the approximation isn't very good, but if I do it with 10 stocks, the approximation improves, and 20 stocks is even better, and 30 stocks better still. In practice, you'd use hundreds if you're trying to replicate an index for a real ETF. But you can see that you can match the index very closely, and you don't need all of the stocks in the index to do that. Here's an ETF which does that. It's the iShares FTSE 250 tracker, where the index obviously has 250 stocks in it. But if we look at the number of holdings in the ETF, there are only 237, and that's almost certainly because they'll have avoided the smallest and least liquid stocks in the FTSE 250. Now a CDO is not an exchange traded security. It can only be traded over the counter, which means if you wanted to buy or sell one, you'd have to contact a counterparty and trade with them directly. So an over-the-counter trade would be something like buying a bespoke suit from Oswald Boateng. You'd have to call him, make an appointment, and be sized up for the perfect fitting suit. Whereas an exchange-traded fund is like an off-the-shelf solution, one size fits all. But it's a lot cheaper, and it's a lot easier to buy and sell. So in terms of pricing, in terms of leverage, and also the liquidity of not just the asset itself, but also its constituents, you really can't compare ETFs with synthetic CDOs. But I think the most interesting point that Berry makes is about orphaned small cap value. 
Money's been attracted to the cheapest ETFs, and those also tend to be the ones which invest in large cap equity. And in a sense, that's often small cap stocks, particularly the ones which have good value. And that's created an opportunity, because if those stocks are overlooked, you may be able to harvest that small value risk premium. So it's ironic that there are now many ETFs which do precisely that. They're designed to harvest this small cap value risk premium. Now, strictly speaking, these are not passive funds. They're active funds, but they're still wrapped up inside an exchange traded fund. But the key thing is that it's forced down the fee that you'd pay to get exposure to that type of factor. You won't have to do the single stock screening yourself. You can get the ETF to do it for you. And while in the UK we don't have many of those small cap value ETFs, Vanguard has created a global liquidity factor ETF. And again, this is designed to harvest that liquidity premium for less frequently traded shares. And those tend to be the small caps. So can we compare subprime CDOs and exchange traded funds? Mm, probably not. But I think the point about value and about small caps is a very interesting one. There is a risk premium which is out there ready to be harvested, but there are also very cheap ETFs which can harvest it for you. You don't necessarily have to do single stock selection, which is quite risky and very difficult if you're not a professional investor like Michael Burry. So if you found that video useful, please support us on Patreon. We rely completely on you. And if you do support us, you can join us on our live Q&A call on a Sunday and ask questions on our Slack channel. We'd love to see you on that call and on Slack. And as always, thank you very much for listening.